So good morning. My name is Donna Van Osten, and I want to thank Reverend Joanne for uh, inviting me to speak today. I'm so very grateful. And uh, the book I'm speaking on is The Secrets of the Lost Mode of Prayer, and it's by Greg Braden. And I chose that book because the very first time I heard Greg speak was at this church. And my husband and I came, and I just fell in love with him. And I'm not sure, but I think I bought the book here. So the hidden power of beauty, blessing, wisdom, and hurt. That's what we'll be talking about the next three weeks. And I took a sentence from Greg's book, and it said, This book is written for those who search for comfort in the presence of fear and uncertainty in the world. Well, I thought, boy, this was 2006, it was, and I'm thinking, aren't we here right now that we're searching, and we're searching in the presence of fear and uncertainty in our world. So the very first line is my favorite line, and I actually kind of live by it. You can ask John. It horrifies him. And there are beautiful and wild forces within us. That's St. Francis of Assisi. There are beautiful and wild forces within us. Is that not true if we stop and really feel? And so let me tell you a secret of the lost mode of prayer. It's feeling. You need to be able to feel. Well, what do we try to do? Not feel. I mean, I do it. I know. And what does prayer do for us? As St. Francis said, it irrigates the earth and the heart. Well, how do we deal with that? People were just talking about gardening. The earth. We have a spiritual understanding as our feet touch the earth. Metaphysically, our feet are understanding. And we share the power of love that comes from our heart. So as we walk about this earth in vertical living, our feet touch the ground as we bless Mother Earth in spiritual understanding. And our heart is open to our brothers and sisters in great love. So what we're really doing in this vertical living is living the power of creation. What does that mean for us? The power of creation is a great magnet. It allows us to participate in healing, in abundance, in peace. We create as we participate. And Carolyn May said a great thing. I wrote it down because I loved it. She said, power because we talk about these things. We say love, we say power. What does this all mean? Well, power, she says, is the theater of life. So when you're dealing with the power of creation and you're dealing with healing, abundance, and peace, who shows up on your stage? If power is the theater, what play are you putting on? What power are you using? What power do people watch? Because one of the things I know about life, and I know this with a capital K, people are watching. And you get praise, but you also get criticism. I had someone really offer to hem my dress after I spoke one time, because she thought it was too long. So, you know, when people are watching, it's not always that they're watching for your greatness. They're watching. But what if power is the theater of life, then who's on your stage? Who is your power? What is your mystery? What are these wild forces within us? What mystery are we sharing with people? And then oneness. Oneness is something that is very, very, very confusing because people look at personality. And they say, well, I can't be oneness with them. Look at how they act. I can't be oneness with them. See what they're doing? But oneness is about the soul. Oneness is about we all have a soul. Oneness is about that we all have choice. Some people choose dark. That's personality. Some people choose light and levity. That's personality. 
but soul is, an ira- is the radiant light that is what we are one with. Then we go to the universe. When I was studying with Jean Houston, she would stress, do you see the universe? This is when we were, we were sending um, our astronauts out. It was, I was in school when they had the great explosion, and she said, we're going to universe to understand universe, and this message is to go within. We are in universe, and the universe is in us. So that vastness that we look out is also the vastness that we look in. And then to understand prayer, that prayer is life. So we can walk in prayer, and we can be silent about it. No one has to know. You don't have to, you know, pontificate what your beliefs are because most people I notice when I do that uh, start to uh, look away or fall asleep or say, there she goes again. You don't have to do that. You have to live it. You have to live it. They'll see They're watching. They may hem your dress, but they'll also watch. So Cahill Gibran said, No man can reveal to you that which already lies half asleep in the dawning of your knowledge. No man can reveal to you that which already lies half asleep in the dawning of your knowledge. So what's our responsibility given that? What's half asleep in us? Our responsibility is like the schools of Socrates. We have to know ourselves. Cahill Gibran is saying, wake up. Who am I? Who am I? Those are questions we have to ask ourselves. So no one else can answer them. And one of the questions now is, how do I let go of suffering and uncertainty in the world? How do I let go of this? Well, it's with a commitment to the I am. Well, the I am, what is that for you? What is the I am? Neville Goddard, who's a spiritual teacher, wrote, the whole of creation exists in you. Listen to that. The whole of creation exists in you. It is your destiny to become increasingly aware of the infinite wonders and to experience a greater and grander portion of it. So if the whole of creation is within us and we're increasing the infinite wonders that we carry and we're to experience a greater and grander portion of it, there's no better place to do it than Westlake Unity because it's going to give us lessons and it's going to give us guidance and it's going to give us tools and we're going to have classes because we don't know how to do that. If I read that quote at someone's coffee, we have coffees with the neighborhood, they wouldn't know what I was talking about. But if I read it here at Unity, they know what I'm talking about. So that's why I want to invite people to Unity, not as a religion, as a way. You know, Christianity was known originally as the way. There is a way. And St. Paul let them know as he wrote a letter to the Galatians and he was trying to tell them how they were living negatively and how they could live positively. And his positive information was fruit of the Spirit. I love that, all these outside gardeners here. Fruit of the Spirit It tells us what to do. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Haven't quite got the last one yet. (laughs) Working on it, working on it. I'm better, aren't I, John? I don't know. (laughs) Self-control, that's a big one for me. But the love, I feel it. The joy, I have joy and peace. And I'm so glad for this. I'm so glad that I have unity to teach me and train me and show me the way because I have children who are raising children in a very uncertain time. And I can be there and we can laugh and play and talk about it. 
generosity of spirit, to have confidence to take the risk to create a world that works for all, that we see our brothers and sisters as one with us, that we feel their soul, that we know. And Greg Braden introduced that we have to honor, and I'm one that believes that, we have to honor the inner and the outer world, knowing that hurt, hurt, which is one of the things we're studying, is gut-wrenching. I don't know if anyone here or out there has ever had hurt to where you're in a fetal position shaking in the bed. I have. And then he teaches that wisdom is the gift that comes after hurt. And wisdom is the healed expression of love. So in the book, they use Beslan, Russia. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but Beslan, Russia was taken over by terrorists. It was the first day of school. It was full of children, full of adults dropping off. At the end of three days, 350 people were killed, most of them, or half of them at least, being children. They went and asked one of the women in the village what she could share about this experience. And she said, we never knew how happy we were. That sentence, I remember Beslan. I'm a current events person. I remember Beslan, and I remember seeing that woman. We never knew how happy we were. How many times are we complaining because we don't have the realization of how happy we are. So, of course, we're going to come on the pandemic. Can't talk about hurt without talking about the pandemic and all our sisters and brothers who are hurt. But I can also talk about the people who came out on their balconies in New York and they played music and they hammered pots and pans, had drums, and they thanked our essential workers. So you saw great joy Great love in the midst of great suffering, great hurt. And here's our personal story, and I want to say that John's here today. I want to honor him. We were an it couple. Do you know what it is to be an it couple? We, uh, that's what we thought of ourselves. Now, they, now, no one else thought that of us, but we thought it of ourselves, and we were the it couple. And so we married, and we were happy, and we had a Thunderbird convertible. What year was it? I can't remember. And we were just an it couple. I mean, you got to be an it couple when, you're, when your roof of your car goes in your trunk. I mean, there's nothing else. And so we had a baby boy. So, of course, then we became responsible. The it kind of went by the wayside. And um, we had a baby boy, and we bought a Torino. And it wasn't even a grand Torino, but we bought a Torino so we could fit a car seat in. All of a sudden, I was pregnant again. I don't need to say I was Catholic, but all of a sudden, I was pregnant again. And we had a child coming, and it was a great pregnancy, and we were happy. John and I have always been happy, and, uh, except when we're not. And so we, um, we had this little baby, and it was a little baby girl, and she had curly brown hair. It was like a poodle. And she had hyaline membrane, which is what Jackie Kennedy's little baby boy had. And after seven days, Colleen died. So all of a sudden, John and I understood the wisdom of hurt. And so we called our friend, the funeral director, and of course, uh, for a newborn baby. In those days, you just did immediate family. So we had a little procession to the cemetery of immediate family. And there's no limousine or anything there. You know, there's a, well, there's a limousine, but no, her, whatever. There's, her little casket was in the back of the car. So we get to the cemetery, and of course, we're in shock. I mean, you know, that's what happens at death. And 
The funeral director, who was a friend, went in the back seat and got the little casket out. And my husband, John, who never, to this day, 52 years of marriage, has ever even attempted to show his masculinity. Not interested. He takes care of children. He takes care of family. Not interested in macho man went to that funeral director and took that casket from him and carried his daughter to her grave, to her resting place. When I saw that, I said, that's the man I want to be with the rest of my life. And I pulled away from my father which was significant because in an Irish family the clan is strong. So to pull away from my father and go to my husband and walk with him was wisdom. Nonetheless, we were in pain and we were hurt. So what happened with the wisdom? What is this expressed love? What was going to come out of this? Well, first I can say to anyone out there who's hurting, and many of us are, take time to heal. Feel the hurt. And then something happened without John and I even realizing it. We knew at that moment that children were a gift. How many parents raise children and don't realize that they're a gift? We knew that they were a gift. And that you're not always just granted this gift. And then we went about our life and we served children for the next 20 years. And we received the Distinguished Youth Service Award from Unity Village, from the Association of Unity Churches. And you know, we mention that, and people are going, yeah, 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 that was a long time ago, 85 to 95, 10 years there. But we also had 10 years of service in the community. You had to have 20 years of service to get this award. The reason why we mention it is because it was a sacred contract. It's not that we have a plaque or a ribbon. It was a sacred contract of hurt being born into wisdom, being born into love. So that's how the pattern works, and that's why I share this story. So you can see the pattern and know that it's significant. But what one of the fruits of the Spirit is patience. It takes time. It takes time to get there. It takes time to feel hurt. It takes time for the wisdom to be born after hurt. It takes time to get out of the bed if you're in a fetal position. So to understand that our vulnerability to live the experience of hurt and know wisdom as love is our communion with spirit. So to put it in simple terms is that our vulnerability is our spirituality. You know, sometimes in the Western culture, we're, we, you know, we've got to be tough, we've got to be this, we've got to be spirituality. That's what keeps us moving. So to understand that the spirit of understanding our feet and the love, which is our heart. So it's love and it's wisdom. Those are our 12 powers. Out of love and wisdom, which is Mary and Joseph, metaphysically, is born the Christ. So when we say the Christ in us, we know that when we look in the mirror, that's what we see. And the simple prayer of the Navajo, the beauty that you live with, the beauty that you live by, the beauty upon which you base your life. So to understand that when we pray for, it invites doubt. Like I couldn't pray for healing, When you pray, you be healing. 
That's what Myrtle Fillmore was. Every cell in her body she talked to, and she invoked the divine intelligence of every cell. When we pray for peace, we're implying there is no peace. We have to be peace in that vertical living that I was talking about. When we pray for love, we're saying we don't have love. But if we be love, you become this great magnet. And all of a sudden, people are showering you with love. So as I close, I want to say that as we heal from hurt and transcend to love, we understand the healing prayer of unity. And when I was a student, you know what the healing prayer was? We are perfection, we are wholeness, and we are health. So you can walk into the sickest room, which I have, of people, and in your consciousness, I'm not talking about male practice here, in your consciousness, you see them and your heart opens and you say in consciousness and silence, you are perfection, wholeness, and health. You are perfection, wholeness, and well-being. And so it is. <laughs>